smart or cheap? Oh, there's Junior Church One, right? Back this way. Well, I'm going to probably get in trouble for this, but I know Mark has a chance to talk about the Cowboys, so I'm going to talk about one of my favorite teams today. Um, now you guys know I'm a Philadelphia Phillies fan. I know, go Phillies. <laughs> but um, a couple weeks ago, um, Phillies skipper Charlie Manuel got fired. And obviously, it was a time coming. You know, even though he's a great manager, it was a time for us to move on from him. And Ryan Sandberg took over. And listening to some of the Phillies players, um, you know, they obviously are horrible this year. Um, but a big part of what they were saying is that they need to get back to the basics of baseball. You know, get back to the basics of playing hard, fielding right, hitting proper, you know. And sometimes, as players, you tend to get so off focus and try to do things you shouldn't do that it, it kind of disrupts your play. Um, and, and today I kind of want to talk about that idea of getting back to some basics of what we are as Christians and get back to the basics of what we should be doing. Um, one thing I, over the past couple weeks, you know, Glenn having a chance to talk about basically big chunk of the basics of Christianity, admitting who you are, submitting to the Lordship of Jesus, and obviously staying committed to living out your faith are the basics of what Christianity is all about. And so today I want to talk about another part of the basics of really who we are as Christians and what we should be doing. And so today I kind of want to talk about this idea of making disciples and not converts. Um, but what I want you guys to do is just close your eyes. Um, and what I want you guys to do is just imagine yourselves at your job. You're working at a desk, or maybe you're construction, so you're building a home, or, or maybe you're a sports player, so you're out playing baseball, and this man, Jesus Christ, comes up to you. A man that you maybe know a little bit, but don't really know a whole lot about. And he comes up to you, and he basically says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so you leave your jobs, you leave your family, and you go and follow a man that you have no idea where you're going. You have no idea what you're doing, where you're going to live, where you're going to put your head, what you're going to eat. But you go and you follow this man. And you spend three years watching this man heal people. You watch this man provide food out of a couple pieces of food. You see him heal people who've been sick for years or blind men who've never been able to see but now can see. And he, and he teaches you, and you follow him, and you learn from him. And then one day, he tells you that he's about to get handed over. And something bad's going to happen to him. And you're like, okay, this man's crazy. But a couple days after that, he gets pinned on the cross. And he gets crucified. And everything you've known about this man kind of comes to a halt. He tells you all this stuff, like he's healed miracles. Okay, why did he die? And so for three days, you're in this hopeless state. You have no idea what's going to happen. And three days later, this man shows up to you again. And some of you guys worship him, but others maybe doubt. And he says this. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded. And lo, I am with you always, be to me. You guys can raise, you guys can open your eyes. As disciples, maybe you guys are thinking in that part, what is he talking about? You know, expecting him to say something like, I've conquered the world, all sins can be gone, there's not going to be any more sin. But he said he tells you to go and basically do what he did. Go and make disciples. And some of you guys are questioning, you know, what are disciples? You know, how, or maybe, you know, what does it mean to teach? What are we teaching on? Or what does it mean to baptize? You know, this, this morning I want to go through and just talk about this verse. And it's a verse you guys all know. Most of you guys probably have it memorized. But I think it's good to be refreshed of really what we're called to do. And to be reminded and encouraged of it. You know, you get, many of you guys are probably saying, I've heard this verse so many times. I know, I know. But I think it's good just to really just be reminded of it who we are as Christians, and what we're really called to do. And so I just want to go through this verse and just talk about a couple things. But one thing Jesus starts off with, and he says this, he says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Now what does that mean? You thought Jesus already had all authority. 
He does, but he's reminding his disciples that I have everything. Everything is under my control. Everything is under me. I control everything. That's what? And he's just saying he's control over everything. You know, he has the right and the power to do anything. And just everything is under him. And basically what he's saying is that, guys, nobody can question my authority. Nobody can question who I am. Nobody can question my decisions. Because I have say over everything. I control everything. You know, in, in your job, you know, you, as one person, like in my job, you know, like I'm just what they call service sales rep. You know, I can't make important decisions. I can't tell people what to do because I don't have that authority. Now the GM or the owner has authority because it's his, it's his company. So he has the choice of what decisions to make. And, and he has the right, and nobody can call into question really his decisions. And so Jesus is saying that I have control of everything. This world is mine. Heaven is mine. And as a result, he goes on and, and he gives a, a command or, or a commission. He commissions his disciples to go out there and do something. And this word go is the first thing. And in this verse, you know, a lot of people, what I've seen, have thought that this word go was the main verb. That, okay, go and do this. But in reality, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to throw in a little Greek in here, and a little Greek grammar, just for us to really understand really what this was just talking about. But the first word we come upon is this word go. Now this word go, it is what you call a participle. It basically supports the verb, or, and modifies a noun, and, and it takes the form of what, like a, an adverb in a sense. And so what he's saying, he's saying this word go. Now, participles usually end in ing. So basically, really what this verse is saying, he's basically saying as you're, as you're going, you know, as you're out there, and as you're going, this is what I want you to do. And this word go doesn't mean go out there and just be lazy, but it means to don't be stagnant, actually move. You know, be intentional, take action. And this is what he's saying. He says, you know, now what I want you to do, because of my authority here on this world, because I have all authority, this is what I want you to do. Now, can you imagine if he comes up and says, I really don't have authority on earth, or I don't have authority in heaven, but I really want you to do this. There's really no power in that if he just comes up and says that. But because he has authority, because he has all power, this commission, this command is powerful. And this is what he wants you to do. And he goes on and says, I want you to make disciples. Now the question is, what are disciples? What does the word disciple mean? <laughs> this is the word in Greek, it's pronounced methetes. And basically what it means is a learner or a follower. So Jesus is telling his disciples to go out there and make learners, to make followers of him. And a quote by Francis Chan, he just says this, he just says, you know, Christ's desire was that his disciples would become like him, imitate him, and carry on his ministry. That was really his desire when he called his disciples, when he, when he called them and told them to follow him. His goal wasn't to end his ministry when he ascended into heaven, but to continue his ministry through his disciples. And that was his desire when making disciples. And so Jesus Christ is going out there and he's saying, as you are disciples, I want you to go make more disciples of me. I want you to go make more followers of me. Don't end it here. Continue on. Well, how do you make disciples? You know, and the disciples are probably thinking, how do you make disciples? Well, the first word he comes upon is this, oh, a couple of verses I have. Um, basically, this is really what disciple, I, I know Glenn talked about this last week, and it just says this, if anyone comes to me and does not hate me, hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even in their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This verse shows you what a disciple is actually about. Now, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start this series called Not a Fan. And this whole series talks about really what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, not somebody that just roots Jesus on. Many of us have favorite players. We know their stats. We know how good they are. But yet it ends there. But what, what this series is going to talk about is this idea of don't just be a fan of Jesus. Don't just know what he's doing but actually become like him. Now, as you know, people who are professional athletes, you know, as people like me who play sports, you know, our desire is to become like people. 
Most of the time we heard, I want to be like Jordan. And so what they do is they follow him, they learn from him, and they do what he does. And so in a sense, they're becoming disciples of Michael Jordan. You know, and they, they practice like him. And so Jesus is saying, don't just be somebody who leads me on, but actually be committed to me. And this verse is that serious. You know, if you're not willing to disown everything, you're not willing to even hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. And he goes on and he says, if you can't carry your own cross, if you can't deny yourself, put away your pride, you cannot follow me. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out there and make followers of me. And in Luke 6.40, it just says this, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. His desire for his disciples is that they would be like him, that they would learn from him and become like him. And that's his desire for his disciples and what he commissioned them to do. And he says, go out there and I want you to baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What is baptism? What does it really stand for? Mm -hmm. Baptism it is, a, is, a, is a symbol of your faith and your commitment to follow Jesus Christ. It's showing people that you, are, you understand what you believe in, in your faith, and you're willing to live it out. And it, it also identifies you with the body of Christ. It identifies you with who Jesus Christ is and, and the body of believers. And more importantly, what it does is it symbolizes the death of your old self and the rising of, of your new self in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is going out there saying, you know, as you go and as you lead people to me, I want you to baptize them. I want you to, to show them really the importance of baptism. And unfortunately, this day and age, baptism kind of takes a back step. And people don't realize how important it is, and they don't think it's actually important. But if you look throughout Scripture, salvation and baptism go kind of coincide. They go back to back. You know, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how important baptism is. Yes, baptism doesn't save you, but it's, I believe, is an ordinance of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ talked about it a lot. You know, if you look throughout Scripture, um, you fill up in Enoch. After Enoch accepted Jesus Christ, he's like, what's stopping me from getting baptized? It's that important. And Paul, Romans 6, 3, and 4, just gives the symbol of it. He says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the, of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism is a new life. It, it shows you being dying to your old self, your sinful self, and being raised to a new life in Jesus Christ, or a new creature. And, and it's a symbol of washing and regenerating. And so Jesus is saying, go out there and show them that they died to their self. And they have a new life in me. And he goes on and he says, I want you to teach them everything that I've commanded you. Okay, so what have you commanded you? Well, there's definitely commandments to love people, to love God. Is there Jesus saying, everything I've showed you guys, from loving people, to interacting with people, to how to defend who you are, this is what I want you to do. I want you to show them really what it means to be a follower of me. And I want you to teach them the gospel and prepare them. And, and, and teaching them doesn't mean just telling them what to do, but teaching them is showing them. I can stand up here all the time and tell you to love people. Love people, do this, do that. But if I'm not showing you how to do that, you will never know how to love people or how to, to really show them Jesus. <laughs> so teaching involves taking action and not just standing there and telling them what to do. And then he says this, and I think this is the most powerful part of this passage. So Jesus is telling them to go out there and make disciples, to baptize, to teach, to go. 
thing is, is he's showing them that they don't have to do this on their own. He finishes with this. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's telling them that as you go, I'm going to be there with you. As you go and you teach and you baptize and you show people who I am, I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to be there with you. You don't have to do this alone. So many times we're, we get into this fear that we're going to do something and we're by ourselves and we feel alone. I don't think Jesus wanted them to feel that. So he's telling them, and it's true. He's going to be there with him. He's going to walk with them. He's going to guide them. He's going to tell them what to do. And, and, and how is this done? Because after he said this, Jesus rose up in the cloud. He was gone. If he's telling them that he's going to be there, but he just left, it's like, okay, Jesus, you just said you were going to be here. Where are you going? And the awesome thing is, is that throughout the Gospels, in the beginning of Acts, it says this. It says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is how Jesus Christ is going to be with you. He's going to be with you through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the power to go out there and make disciples. To go out there and, and create followers of me. You know? And that's, I, I think that's something we need to be reminded of. Because so many times we get so concerned, okay, how do I go out there and tell people about Jesus? How do I go out there and explain to them what I believe? This is how you do it. You rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's through the Spirit that you will have the words to go out there and tell them who Jesus is. Because by yourself, you will fail miserably. But it's with the whole power of the Holy Spirit that you can go out there and make a powerful difference in everyone around you. The question we have all this, and this is the question I want, I want you guys to ask yourself. What does making disciples or disciple making look like in your life? What does it look like? But maybe you're wondering, how do I learn how to make disciples? How do I, how do I live that out? How do I, how do I make disciples? I have no idea. And the greatest thing about this is that learning how to make disciples doesn't start in a classroom. Yeah, you go in a classroom and, and we can open up a book and just read, okay, how to make disciples or how to evangelize. But disciple making doesn't start in a classroom. And the most important thing I think I want to encourage you guys with this is this. Imitate Jesus. If you want to learn how to make disciples, imitate what he did. Go in depth. Read the Gospels. Look at who he was and what he did. And, that, and that's the most important thing. Is that we need to imitate Jesus. And we need to follow what he did. We need to love like he loved. But so many times is that we go away from that, and we try to do things ourselves, and we try to follow something else. See, in Scripture, Jesus gave a warning for, not, for, for trying to make people believers of Jesus and living a different life. Because so many times we try to go out there and, and lead people to Christ. We go out there and try to make converts, but that's it. You can, make, you can try to make me a believer, and I may believe, but if you don't show me how to live that or how to, to continue going, it's just going to stay there. It's just going to stay at that, that one point of believing. In Matthew 23, and I think this is crucially important, he gives a warning to the Pharisees. And he says this, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them. Do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to, to, move, to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacter trees wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call, call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master. And you are all brothers, and do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. 
The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides, who say if anyone spares by the temple, it means nothing, but if anyone spares by the gold of the temple, he is bound by oath. And he just continues to go, and he's warning these teachers, these Pharisees. They go out there and try to lead people to Jesus or make converts. But they're living a hypocritical life. And to start at the beginning of what it means to make disciples, is you've got to make sure that your life is imitating Jesus. You've got to make sure that your life is living for him. And I think that's what Glenn talked about. And I think that was powerful leading up to this, is that Glenn talked about really what it means to be a follower of Jesus by admitting who you are, by submitting to the Lordship of Jesus, and to staying committed to living for Him. That's so important if we are going to make disciples. But the thing is, is I talked about these participles of go, of baptizing and teaching. But the main verb in this sin, the main verb in this, this verse is to make disciples. And see, making disciples is what they call an imperative. It's necessary. It's required. No questions asked. Jesus is saying, you have to do this. But this is how I want you to do it. And so this commission to his disciples wasn't just to his disciples. It was to everyone who becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. Who becomes a disciple. And it keeps on going. And I think that's the beautiful thing of really what Christianity is about. It's not about going out there and leading people to Jesus and ending it there. But to go out there to lead them to Jesus and to show them what it means to be a Christ follower. And what it means to live out your Christian life. Because if we just stop at making disciples or, or converts, they're not going to know what to do. And so our job, and what we're required and what we're commissioned to do by Jesus Christ is to go out there and to make disciples, to go out there and make followers, not just converts. And when I look at this verse, for me, I feel a sense of honor and privilege to know that the Son of God, the one that has authority for everything, has asked us to do something for Him. See, He doesn't, he doesn't need us. He has the power to do whatever He wants. But the, but the awesome thing is that He wants us to participate in his ministry. He wants us to participate in what his goal is and what his desire, what his will is. And for me, I think that's awesome. I mean, if, if the president came up to me and asked me something, I would be honored to, to actually do something for him. You know, and I think that's just an awesome thing to know that we have the God of this universe asking us to participate with him in his kingdom building. The thing is, is that, and, and sad, these statistics I saw is that there's only, majority of the people going from one church to the other, when a church is growing, majority of the time it's because people are leaving one church and coming to the other. That's how church is growing. There's a statistic that says that only like 3% of growth is actually people coming to know Jesus Christ and living and growing in that church. And when I look at that, I see that I, I, we, I think we failed to do our job. We failed to do what we're called to do. You know, if, if, and in that sense, you know, the kingdom isn't growing because one person is going from church to church. The only time the kingdom grows is when we <coughs> go out there, proclaim the gospel, people come to him, they grow, they become a follower, then they go out there and do the same. And it's just a domino effect. The more people are coming to Jesus Christ, but if we just encourage people that are at another church that maybe not like that church, hey, come to my church. That's not growing the church. That's growing people in the building you meet in, but that's not growing the body of Christ. And I want to encourage you guys that disciple making isn't something that's just for Mark and I. It's not something just for Glenn or teachers or the elders. Making disciples is, is for all of us. 
See, Mark and I can't do it on our own. We can't go out there and make disciples on our own. Because if he tries to reach other people, you know, how many of them really become followers? Maybe one. And then he tries to reach more, and his energy is wasted. But if he goes out there and makes disciples, then they go out there and make more disciples. It just grows. So we need your help. Jesus isn't just calling us. He's calling you guys. This isn't just something to have people with the gift of teaching or the gift of preaching. This is something that's required of every believer in Jesus Christ, no matter who you are. I know for me, when I first started the youth ministry here, I got so frustrated because the kids weren't believing in Jesus and they weren't living that life. So I got so focused on leading them to Jesus and I got frustrated if they didn't. But more recently, when I'm thinking about this, God has got a hold of me. He's like, your job isn't to lead them to Jesus Christ. Your job is to make them followers of me. Your job is to show them what it means to be a follower of me. And it wasn't until I started focusing on that and realizing what my job actually is that I actually started to see fruit. I started to see growth. Because I, I started focusing on what Jesus is calling us to do. See, salvation is his job. He saves them. It's our job to show them who Jesus is. It's our job to show them the love of Jesus. And this is what I encourage you guys. Disciple making doesn't have to start when somebody believes in Jesus. I think disciple making can start before they, become to, before they come to know Jesus. If you have a, a worker at work that you talk to on a daily basis, and you show them the love of Jesus, I think that's when the second making starts. It starts when they see Jesus. When they come to know Jesus, it, it, it gets deeper and deeper. But the second making, I think, can start before they come to know Jesus, through your actions, through what you say. If we go out there, and we start, start bashing people, and start telling them, oh, God doesn't like what you're doing, without showing them the love of Jesus, they're not going to come to you. I'm reminded of a passage where these people were going to stone this woman for her sin. And Jesus goes up and says, he who is about to sin can cast the first stone. Jesus didn't go out there and bash the sinners. He actually went out there and hung out with them. He showed them love. He, he showed them what it means to, for God to love them. And I want to encourage you guys, disciple-making it starts with us imitating Jesus. And in verse, in verse John 2, 6, it says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And Ephesians 5, 1 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Our first priority is to imitate Jesus in the lives of others. To show them really what Jesus stood for. To show them the love. And other ones is, if you want to know what it means to, to make disciples, Get involved in ministry. Get involved, and you'll start seeing it. And more importantly, this, this series coming up, I want to encourage every one of you guys to get involved in a care group. If you really want to know what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples, it starts with you getting involved. You can't do it by sitting at home. You need to get involved in some kind of ministry or in somebody's life. Be intentional. Make it a priority in your life to show Jesus to others. Be available. Jesus Christ provided, made his life available to his disciples and to anyone else around him. He made himself available and he was committed to the people around him. And be relational. I think that's so important. Jesus Christ was relational to his disciples. He hung out with them had conversations with them. It wasn't always about the gospel. I think it was about their life. Jesus made a point to get to know his disciples. And he made a point for them to get to know who he is. So be relational. Be available. More from pray. I think that's one of the bottom lines that we need to do is that we need to pray. And Mark, before Jesus, made, before Jesus chose his disciples, he said that he prayed all night. And then the next morning he went out there and chose his disciples. I think that's crucially important, is ask God, God, who is it that you want me to disciple? Who is in my life? Ask him for the power. Ask him to show you. And I believe that's what Jesus did. He prayed to the Father all night, and then went out there and chose his disciples. 
and to live out the gospel. It's so important as we living out what Jesus did, showing them that Jesus loved them so much that he died for them and that he rose again to give them life. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. And he's encouraging us and he wants us to live out the gospel, to live out who Jesus is. And Jesus didn't call us just to go out there and make comments. This commission, this, this great commission that we have, this, this privilege that we have to serve, doesn't say, I want you to go out there and make converts, and that's it. He says, I want you to go out there, make disciples, make followers of me, show them who I am. Jesus is saying, everything that I've showed you, the, the love, the grace, the mercy, the acceptance, Everything I've showed you and I've taught you guys, this is what I want you to do. Just go out there and, and be mean to the people. So I want to encourage you guys, go out there and be Jesus. Be Jesus to the ones around you. Be Jesus to your family. See, disciple making doesn't have to be some random person. Disciple making can start with your family. It can start with your wife. It can start with your husband. It can start with your kids. And parents, I want to encourage you guys, for your kids, be Jesus especially to them. Show them what it means to, to be a Christ follower. Because you are the main spiritual leaders in their life. And they watch you. They watch what you do. I know in my family, unfortunately, you know, my mom says she believes, but you know, she doesn't go to church and she doesn't do these things. And her kids are like, why should I believe? Unfortunately, I have siblings that don't believe in Jesus because they're watching my parents and they're like, you're not living it out. Why should I? I want to encourage you guys to live out your Christian faith for them. Show them what it means to be a believer, to be a follower of Jesus. Because their relationship with Jesus starts with you guys. It starts with them watching you. It starts with them seeing what you do, that you make a requirement to spend time with Jesus. That you make a requirement to go out there and fellowship with others. They see you, they watch you. And if you're not living out the gospel, if you're not living for Jesus, I don't think they're going to want to either. There's no reason for them if they don't see that you're living out there. So I want to encourage you guys as parents to be disciple makers to your kids. Disciple your kids. Show them who you are. Show them Jesus. This is so important. And we're not alone in this process. We're a team. And if we work together, I guarantee you, we will conquer this. We will overcome what this world is telling our kids. Our kids, <coughs> our kids. Actually, the youth group is my kids. <laughs> but we will conquer what this world, this world is, is getting worse. What's on TV, the entertainment, the, the, the role models they have are not role models. I mean, people like Miley Cyrus, who you guys really need to pray for. People like that, these, our kids watch what they do. They listen to that music. And if we don't work together with the power of Jesus Christ, we can't conquer that. So let's, I encourage you guys, let's team up. Let's work together to disciple our kids and to show them who Jesus is. And to show them that, that the Christian life is amazing that it's worth believing and show them who Jesus is. Jesus didn't call us to make comments just to make believers. He called us to make followers of Jesus. I don't encourage you guys, you know, as, as this month goes on, as Mark talks about this, you know, I, I don't touch the surface. In a couple weeks, Mark's going to really dig deep into what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you guys, Get the church when he does. Get involved in care groups. Get involved in this study. Because I guarantee you, this study is going to blow you away. It's going to really convict you. And I pray that it will convict us. And that it will really show us what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And not somebody that says, oh yeah, I root for Jesus. Jesus is this, Jesus is that. But saying, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. We can say we're Christians all we want, and a lot of people say we're Christians. But if somebody asks you who you are, say that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that you're living for him, that you're living out the life that he called us to live. Like Glenn said last week, it's not going to be easy. 
And it's going to require us to deny ourselves, to look, carry our own crosses to follow Him. I want to encourage you guys, church, live on your life and show people what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I have a video. I want you guys to watch this video. It starts with making followers of Jesus, not just people that believe or that are fans, but people who are fully dedicated to living out the Christian life. And when we do that, and when people see who Jesus is, they'll be free of what's holding them down. That's through them finding Jesus, and they can't find Jesus unless we show them who Jesus is. Don't go out there and just try to save them, because that's not our job. Our job isn't to save them. Our job is to show them Jesus and to lead them to a life of following Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, God, you commissioned us to go out there and make disciples, to make followers of you. And I pray, God, that we won't stay stagnant. I pray that we would be intentional, that we would go out there and do it. Lord, as we're going, as we're going from place to place, that we will make it a priority in our life to show people Jesus and to impact them and to embrace them and show them love. God, I pray that you would just provide us with the power to do it and help us, Lord, to change this world. Help us to make followers of you and just to live a life that others can see Jesus. God, help us to imitate Jesus. Jesus name. Amen.